Hello and welcome back to coverage here at Grand Prix Dallas Fort Worth. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe. I'm in the booth with Paulo Vitor, Domin Risa, the Hall of Famer, and we are ready for Aaron Rubin versus Billy Hahn. It's our first quarterfinal match. This is the first seed, Aaron Rubin. He's really kind of had his way with the tournament coming in in that first seed and really no doubt about it. Yeah, it's interesting. He also chose to play, which has been the more common choice in draft, and when I agree with. In sealed, I think we saw more people choosing to draw. We did definitely more than we did here in booster draft. No doubt about that. Blood Tallow Candle is going to be the play for Ruben. Yeah, sometimes you want to say that for his turret triggers. He doesn't have a lot of sorry triggers other than, I believe he has two Cabal Paladins, and that is it. That's right. So you could still consider saving it, but if you're planning on curving, you know, playing a four drop and then a five drop, then, and then, you know, a six drop or something, then you, you might not be able to. This is actually a, a critical juncture in the game because if Aaron Rubin has that syncopate that we mentioned a minute ago, he's really going to want to use it after having looked at the deck list. The land count here is eight forest, four island, four mountain, memorial to genius in a hinterland harbor for what ends up being a pretty greedy mana base here with double green, double blue, and one, two, three, four, five red cards in here as well. Okay, yeah, that is a little bit more on the three-color end of the spectrum as you normally see. We've seen a lot of splashes in this format, uh, especially with Skidding and Surveyor, but... Academy Drake's the play now for Aaron Rubin, though it does seem that he's missed his land drop for the turn. Yeah, he is. Uh-oh. Yeah, when one, one player's him. accelerating and the other one's missing land drops, this could get out of hand quickly. It's a Mammoth Spider now for Billy. Yeah, last time we saw that, we saw Man Nass playing a 1-3 creature and his opponent kicking Joseph as the turn after that. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I can confirm that accelerating will beat not playing any lands. That's right, time. yeah. And so can Matt for that matter. Land drop number four, though, for Ruben does hit, though he hasn't actually played anything. And Mammoth Spider's going to get in the red zone. That's going to put Aaron Rubin down to 17 life. But this is what I'm really curious about, what the follow-up play is for Billy. It looks like he's got a nice one. Cloud Reader Sphinx. Yeah. Oh, but the syncopate is in hand here for Rubin. He must have just drawn it. Well, I guess the turn prior, well, we knew he drew a land this turn. No, he had that. Oh, he just uh, chose not to cast it. He chose not to cast it under growth. Okay. And then the turn he, he tapped out for the Drake, he's going to play a spider. So he actually paused a little bit when, when he cast a growth. So I assume he had it. I didn't. I, I agree. I thought he was posturing after he let it resolve. Because, as you know, when you're missing mana, you often can't afford to leave up Syncopate. And the uh, growth from the Ashes makes the Syncopate a bit worse. It does, but at the same time, there are a lot of 5-drops in those colors. Mm. So I assume Aaron just thought, well, I can just counter the 5-drop mm -hmm. the following turn. Then he drew the Drake. We're like, well, that's awkward. I have to play the Drake here. I can't just pass and do nothing. Right. So, But in the end, he actually got some value out of it anyway, so it worked out well for him. Yeah, it did. He did end up getting that Cloud Reader Sphinx. And the Guardian of Koilos on the battlefield does hold off the Spider. Plus, that is land number 5 for him, so... Aaron Rubin looks like he's surviving. Yeah, he is. And, you know, he's just just play the Land Royale Elves, which at this point in the game is basically not a card. Right. So as good as Land Royale Elves is, it has its downsides. Absolutely. And now if Aaron draws a land, he can just sack that candle, kill the spider, and attack for six if he wants to do that. Boy, he did hit a land. Man, just a steady stream of lands off the top of the library for Aaron Rubin. But that's exactly what he wanted. And I think he's on the uh, Apollo plan. No, he's got a six drop. He's going to continue to de develop his board out, play the cold water snapper, then pass the turn back. But he still has that option available to him next turn. Now he's attacking for even more. Yeah, that is true. And we might see an eviscerate. Well, we won't see an eviscerate, but... Yeah, we could we could have seen if there wasn't for the Academy Drake, we would probably have seen the Visser Eight on the Guardian of Coilus, because you just can't afford to take this much damage if if Aaron does decide to use the candle. Mm. But given that he has a creature to play, 
I believe that's fine. Academy Drake offering to trade off I think for I the Guardian or block the Drake. I think I still like killing the Spider if you're killing one of the creatures. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's what Aaron goes for. It because Definitely. then the Snapper can attack and the Guardian can attack. That's right. Now one option that Billy does have is a double block on the Snapper. And he is going to go for it here. Are you going to see Fungal Infection? <laughs> I was thinking that myself, but it uh, looks like no. So it is going to be just a trade for the Drake. And honestly, Billy's probably going to breathe a little bit of a sigh of relief at being able to complete that transaction. Yeah. Those snappers can be really annoying. They can. They really can. But I think in this spot, I, I don't think Aaron has Fungal Infection in his deck. And Billy should know that. I think they get that close... Uh, you know, in round one already. Maybe they don't get them round one, though. P pools. Pools, yes. They, they did review they did. pools, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he knows it's a safe block. I see in Bolas' clutches in hand, I believe, for Aaron Rubin. Yeah, that's pretty good. I would just cast that. I like that advice. That's why you're a Hall of Famer. Yeah, I, I try. You've identified that it's A, good, and that he should cast it. Well, a lot of the time you think... My opponent might have a bomb oh, that I, I want. Yeah, I mm -hmm. should wait. Which is, you know, is what he's thinking now. Mm -hmm. He's playing very conservatively here. Mm -hmm. But I think when you're stealing a four-four, attacking for six, your opponent will be down to eight. Or if they they can jump block the elf, they'll be down to twelve. But you're gonna have two flyers. One of which is bigger than any flyer your opponent will likely play. Mm -hmm. But we don't know Billy's deck and Aaron does. So what if you know they have a Zahid Gene of the Lamp, for sure, example? Then sure. you might want to save your Imbolus clutches because that's the only yeah. answer you have in your deck. Right. No, but that is, a, that is a, a good thing to consider for the long term. How much do you factor in what Billy's done over the last few turns, kicking two Academy Drakes? I mean, I assume that's the best he can do. Mm -hmm. So if he has a better card in hand, he's not like he would have played it. So it's yeah. either a card he can't cast or he doesn't have it. Look it's at this. Best I of both worlds, Paulo. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> he attacks, offers the trade, gets in for four, and then steals it. <laughs> Yeah, but I think he wouldn't want to trade. I, it wasn't actually yeah. the best of both worlds because he could have attacked with the Drake as well had he still oh. in pre-combat. <laughs> yeah, so he just missed two damage. Yeah, I, I, I meant it tongue-in-cheek. <laughs> <laughs> it was more like one it, or the other, right? You either yeah. steal it and attack with both or you don't steal it and only attack with one. I believe so. It is actually the worst of both worlds yeah. because you use your boss switches and you didn't get the two damage in. Right. <laughs> Now, let's see if Billy has an answer. I think he has Eviscerate at the ready. Yeah, he does. I mean, now it's a question of whether he has a lot of bounce in his deck or not. Because if he has bounce, he wants to kill the Guardian and have the ability to bounce the Drake back to his own hand. If he doesn't have bounce, then he kills the Drake because that flies. So it seems like he does not have a lot of bounce or is not planning on having a lot of bounce in the near future. And now this Llanowar Elf is uh, kind of fulfilling its prophecy here. <laughs> the late game Llanowar Elf gen de generally becomes a chump block, and that's what happens here. And Aaron Rubin, while not a particularly strong follow-up with the Cabal Evangel, it actually looks pretty good here as it represents a lethal attack if Billy's just completely out of gas. I believe he has a... A, a spell in hand. I just can't identify what it is. Is it another Drake? I think it looked like Imbolus Clutches, but it's probably not that. It might just be another Drake. There it is. Is that Broken Bonds in his hand also? Well. Wow. Oh, it is. And that is also the type of card that will lead you to killing the Guardian and not the Drake with the Eviscerate. Because you can just destroy the Imbolus Clutches and get your Drake back. Wow. So, yeah, if that card is in my deck, I, and I'm not dying to the Flyer immediately, I might lean towards killing the Guardian there. Just to give yourself that out of having the Drake back on your side. Yeah, some people are talking about, you know, oh, Drake is legendary when you steal it with mm -hmm. Imbolus Clutches. It is legendary, but the way the rules work is that both permanents have to be legendary for mm -hmm. you to be forced to sacrifice one. So if you have two Drakes, one is legendary and one isn't, that's okay. You don't have to sack anything, which was the case here for Aaron. Wow, this is another haymaker, by the way, right back for Aaron Rubin. He has... Cold water snapper right when Billy thought he had finally stabilized with his 4-4 flyer against the two 2-2s. 
Aaron has the perfect answer yet again. A 4-5. Yeah. Take a look at Aaron Rubin. Again, he's really been running it up this weekend. And he says combat. Two-turn yeah. clock. Pretty safe attack here. Mm-hmm. That's going to knock half of Billy's remaining life total away. Yeah, Billy has to draw something now. Oh, is that the shade? It's soul salvage. Devastating play here for Ruben because even if Billy manages to get out of this mess at the moment, he's going to be facing down another snapper. <laughs> I can't imagine an out now. Yeah, three snappers in one game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, wow, this one swung much. away from Billy Hahn very quickly. He honestly, like, I thought he was in really good shape just two turns ago. Yeah, he was definitely in an okay position at least. Yeah. As opposed to just being dead. Right. Which he is now. Now he's just dead. Geez, soul salvage. And remember, this is the game where Aaron Rubin stumbled on mana early and then just started picking up land after land after land, and Billy Hans is going to pick up his permanence because that is Aaron Rubin. Yeah, I feel like game number one. both players drew a lot of lands in the late game, except one of them started with two and mm -hmm. one started with five. So they both kind of ended up blue with flooded, but Billy was even more flooded. Man, the... 4-4 Flying Drakes from Billy Hahn just didn't match up well against the 4-5 Snappers from Aaron Rubin. And boy, did he have a bunch of them. Looks like some pretty extensive sideboarding going on here, though, for Billy. He's already got two cards pulled out and is still looking through the sideboard on top of it. Yeah, I mean, that is smart from Billy. If he has cards like Pardic Wonder or uh, Primordial Worm, mm -hmm. he might want to bring them in because they match up well against the Snappers. And obviously, he can kill the Snappers or Hexproof. So if he has access to 5-5s five or bigger, then they're probably good in this matchup. And Aaron does not have a lot of removal, exactly. So if you just play a, like a Primordial Worm, that might be enough. That might just stall you know? out the game. Yeah, that might stop the ground forever. And we know Billy has at least three Drakes, because <laughs> we've seen mm -hmm. basically a Drake every turn of the game. Yeah, that was an interesting one. Both players actually ended up drawing a lot of lands for the game, but Billy was kind of punished for it because he just didn't have a whole lot to spend it on in the late part, where Aaron Rubin did manage to just top deck and draw a bunch of good action. Soul Salvage was really a backbreaker there. Yeah, and it's, you know, cars like Embolus' Clutches are just very swingy in a matchup like this because they dealt with both a 4-4 Flyer and an Eviscerate. Mm -hmm. So if you're drawing... You know, if you're just exchanging resources, a card like Imbolus's Clutches would just dominate everything. Right. I mean, those two cards that you just mentioned are really good, right? 4-4 four, four Flyer and a premium removal spell. It's like, it would be hard to come back from that. And, uh, of course, it was. Players are once again consulting the pool from their opponent, seeing, hey, I wonder if there's anything that you might want to bring in. Some Pierce the Skies or something along those lines. Yeah, if I'm Aaron then I'm going to look at how much removal my opponent has, and I might take out my like, most uh, final offering. Because he only has three legendary creatures. Mm. Well, two in, a, in, in Bolas' clutches. So if you assume your opponent is actively going to be gunning for those, which they will be because they know you're a list, then it, it, if they have a lot of removal, you could consider signing them out. Taking a look at the deck list here in the booth with Paulo to see maybe what we might be able to guess is yeah, coming or going. From Will and Hum, I like one Primordial Worm. He has two in his pool, one in his main deck. I like bringing the second one in. Uh, I assume that's one of the cards he has. He also has one Pierce the Sky. But he hasn't seen that many flyers. I think Aaron Rubin saw more flyers than he did. That's right, yeah. So I don't know if I would bring that in yet. And he also has his Lean Voda, the Rising Deep, if he's looking for something really big. <laughs> you know, after you flood out like that, sometimes you think, I just wish I had more big stuff. <laughs> I just wish I had his Lean Voda. I don't re <laughs> recall ever thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> he has Helm of the Host, too, that he, he never drew. That is a good 
Manasink. Yeah, I believe he first picked that. We didn't actually get a chance to watch the draft, but I, I think that that was shown. Or maybe I just heard from it. But it know. makes sense. Mm -hmm. I would. What can we learn about William? He's from Iowa. He is a predictive maintenance analyst. That sounds really complicated. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Yeah. He's probably <laughs> smarter than we are. Yeah, he's probably really smart. Yeah, we play magic. <laughs> This is kind of funny. He says, what color combinations did you draft on day two? Black, white with Urza's Ruinous Blast and Traxos. And then he drafted black, white with Traxos again. <laughs> Got him in here. <laughs> he says, the most exciting play he's made in Dominaria Limited is <coughs> Yargle picking up on Sarah's wings. That is pretty exciting. It is very exciting. He said it would be a lifelong dream accomplished if he can manage to win this thing, and it would be one more win for Iowa, which, of course, is where he's from. Very cool. Yeah, I know. Aaron Rubin, I really just wanted to qualify for the PT, but it would be a fantastic accomplishment. So Done. Book it, Aaron. We'll see you there, buddy. Now all you got to do is just win a couple of more matches, and you could uh, qualify for the PT, get a trophy, get 10K, and... Some pro points. Lanamore Scout here on turn two from Billy Han, though. Is it going to get activated or attacking? I've never seen that card get activated. It never gets activated, ever. Unless people have Tachi Uva. That is the one scenario yeah. where it just act gets activated every turn. But, I mean, why wouldn't it, wouldn't it be sweet here to, like, tap it, put a land into play, put a Baloth Gorger or something, and be like... Oh, we would, but it's out? literally never happened. It's just impossible. Yeah. If you have it on turn two... You do not have an extra land in your hand. That's just the rule. Oh, here we go again, though. Billy Han is going to be ahead on mana. Gets a swamp. What does he have going on there, Paulo? Has one eviscerate. I believe that is his only black. That's the one. We saw that in game one. Yeah. He has a Rona Disciple of Geeks in his sideboard. He's okay. not even playing that. Yeah, so eviscerate is his only black. So Ruben's playing his, but that's to try to turn on... Yogmoth's Vile Offering, which is... Well, it's a little sketchy. Is this go to discard? Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Ruben's missing land drops again? It worked out well for him last time, but yeah, he's it missing did. some more this time. Does he have the Syncope? No, he doesn't, and this is really bad news for Aaron Ruben. If he doesn't hit a land drop here, this one could be over before we know it, and he's discarding again. Billy Hahn says... I drew too many lands last time. This time, you're not going to draw enough, and he's got to capitalize on it. And there it is, Primordial Worm. Yeah, you called it. There's the first one. That's <laughs> Primordial Worm number one, right. <laughs> and that's it. Game's over. Wow, Billy Han immediately See? strikes back. So I was right, Primordial Worm. You were 100% correct. A great read. And Billy says, that's how I drew it up. You miss lands, I accelerate, and the game ends immediately. So Aaron Rubin is going to have to collect himself again. Not much of a game there. Not really much to think about. He kept a two-lander and didn't get there. But yeah, it means we get a game three here, Paulo. So we do, yes. It's exciting for us. Yeah, it doesn't look like anyone is changing anything. Yeah, That's Billy's going to consult one more time just in case there was something that he missed, but... Oh, he has three of your favorite cards in the sideboard, Corrosive Ooze. He's not playing any in the May deck, so does that make you happy? Very. And I think that looking at the deck list from Aaron, he's going to keep it that way. Yeah, I don't see a lot of equipment. No. I Aaron's guess the deck. Cabal Paladins might make you want to have one in your deck, but... Yeah, but he has plenty of, you know, he has two Corrosive Druids... He has access to a Lenore Envoy if he wants. Got some um, updates from our other matches here as well. Kudva versus Rosas is uh, one to one, so they're going to game number three. Brown won his match two games to zero over Andrew Ellenbogen. And the Stanky Craddock match is at one to one, going to game three as well. So, one match down, but the rest of them are all going to game three. All right, let's hit our land drops here, gentlemen. Not too many of them, but uh, 
love to see a game. I don't see a lot of lens for Billy. Don't say that. Is this going to be the shade? Oh, my God. Turn three <laughs> dread shade for Aaron Rubin. This could be quick. Well, there are a lot of lens, actually. He has at least two more. Okay, but does he have an answer for a sh dread shade? A 3-3 three three that doesn't get smaller. It doesn't. <laughs> yeah, that shade is going to be tough to answer out of the, the blue-green deck. Right. This is where a deep freeze would be nice. Put that shade on ice. Yeah, that shade is often a three-turn clock if you just you know, commit to pumping it every time you attack, which realistically is almost never the case because you would rather be casting more spells than pumping it. Because, mm -hmm. you know, what if they do something to it? You attack, you pump it twice, then they make four separlings. They're like, well, now all my work is. Right. Oh, I remember but with my least favorite play of the format, Mill U. Target U with Homeward Explorer. I don't like it either. Remember, what was one of the key cards in game number one? Soul Salvage, right? Yeah, yeah. He Target has that yourself. in his deck. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> also, I believe he milled one card too little. Unless it, it is four. No, it it's four. Yeah, but how many did he mill? He only milled three. No, oh, okay. I'm, I'm saying you're right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, we should uh, we should make sure that they get that next that last card. It is four in this case. Yeah, like, there's so many reasons to mill yourself. You know, Memorial to Folly, Soul Salvage, Gito Chronicler... And your opponent could have that. They could have, you know, Multani, uh, cars like that. Obviously, you know. Yeah, Billy needs to mill one more card from the top of his library. Aaron cast the Hummer to explore targeting Billy, but they didn't fully resolve the effect as it's supposed to mill the top four instead of just the top three. And, you know, William has a Soul Salvage in his pool, and he's flashing black. Mm. So he's not playing it. But Aaron doesn't know that. Aaron doesn't have that class. He only has pulls. So it, it's really dangerous to just target Billy with that with that effect. And it's really for Jeez. no reason because he doesn't, you know, unless you get decked, it doesn't matter. The probabilities are all the same. Right. So what happened, by the way, is Croson Druid hit the battlefield last turn for Billy. Now it's his turn. Pretty sure he's drawn his card for the turn as well. But they still need to figure out what to do about resolving the rest of this. It may just be mill the next card. I mean, uh, it shouldn't matter. Probabilistically speaking, it it's the exact the same, same thing. But, but yeah. sometimes people get hung up on which card it actually was and that kind of thing, which I don't think they're going to be able to save that as the card, if he has drawn it. It's already just in his hand and indistinguishable. Yeah, we also don't know what was said. Like, maybe right. Aaron just said target you, or maybe he said mill three, mm -hmm. and then those are probably two different resolutions. Oh, also, uh, uh, for the milling thing, both players have Rona in your pool. That's another card that wants you to put cards in your own graveyard. So Yeah, this uh, it's funny because these are incremental advantages slash disadvantages, but that is uh, that could absolutely affect the outcome of this game. And... Uh, yeah, it At really this point, could. I kind of hope it doesn't. Like, <laughs> like you know... I kind of hope it does. Is, you want the justice factor? I, I do like justice. Yeah. No, I feel you. Well, like, maybe I don't want it to matter, you know, but I want him to draw Rona the very next turn and be like, oh. Oh. And be like an enlightening and moment. And then never again. Never again, <laughs> yes. And, you know, that could decide a game or it could not decide a game. I don't care about that. Yeah, but yeah. Would it be more justice if Billy paid, played Rona and got to pick something up? That would also be an O oh moment. And then Aaron played his own Rona and looked at his empty graveyard. And, <laughs> and just said, go. Okay, I figured it out. I'm supposed and to mill myself. And then, and then drew the Soul Salvage and then Yagmos Vile Offering. And mm -hmm. No, I guess with Vile Offering, you could actually steal one of their creatures. So if they have a lot of great cards, maybe you mill them for that. Chad is wondering if we can use instant replay or some such to uh, to assist in a ruling, but we can't actually do that here uh, at the Grand Prix level. That's the kind of thing that you need to put some infrastructure in place on, both tec technically speaking, like the technology needs to be there to be able to pull that up in a in a quick fashion, but also it has to work within the system that the judges use themselves. We do have something set up at the Pro Tour level where the judges do have access to a replay and the chat stream, and they can consult that if needed. 
Um, but at the Grand Prix level, we do not. That is a... Uh, it actually takes a lot. It's, it's more than you'd think. It's not just hitting rewind on some random file. And uh, so, so, no, that is not an option here. The judges are going to have to just uh, use it themselves. So, assuming that Billy drew a card, I didn't see what it was, you know, which one it was. And it yeah, once it's in his hand, it's not like Billy either. can say, well, it was this one, I promise. And then, you know, Mill is worse card. That's not going to work. So, the real question is just, do you finish resolving it by milling one more card or do you say well i'm sorry but it didn't happen the way it was supposed to and we just have to stick with it so we'll find out shortly here yeah whatever the resolution is i'm gonna say it's highly unlikely to matter to the actual outcome of the game like either you mill one extra card or you don't and you know it's probably not gonna do anything but they still have to sort it out Uh, do have some more updates here as well. Kudva has won his match 2-1 against Rosas, so he's going to go ahead and move on. And uh, Will Craddock has also won over Stanky. Oh, so those were pretty fast matches. Yeah, they were all going to game three when we were coming in. Oh, okay. I was going to say, considering we had basically a non-game in game two. Yeah, they actually were. So the resolution is that you just don't do anything. You mill yeah. those three and... And they just decided they couldn't finish it beats. properly. Yep, good beats, okay. exactly. So divination for Billy Han, though. He's got way too many cards in hand, perhaps just needing to hit a land drop there. No, he had a land already. I don't think... I yeah, he definitely he had one. He had nothing to do with it, yeah. Does, oh, is he down to seven now? Okay. I thought he would be at eight for some reason. So that works out fine for him anyway. Plays divination, plays a land, passes the turn back. But uh, what's not fine is that divination did not help him set up for blocking or dealing with this dread shade. Yeah, or the home raid, even. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah. <laughs> the, the other 3-3. Three, three. Yeah, the one that costs more and does less. Yeah, we could. Are we going to see just a bunch of pumps here from Aaron? Or just some pumps? Looks like two is what he settled on, wanting to use the rest of his mana for the turn still. That's a lot of damage, and Billy Hahn is really under pressure at this point. There's a divest out of the sideboard for Ruben. Take a look at what he's got. <laughs> he's got Sylvan Awakening. Cloud Reader Sphinx. What else can he actually take? Just the Sphinx? Well, I think that's the only card he wanted to take. Uh -huh. I think, is that a Helm of the Host and a bunch of lands? Yes, and then there might be uh, a Sapperling Migration in there, perhaps? I think... It's either a bunch of lands and a sapling migration or just a bunch of lands. But at any rate, the Cloud Reader Sphinx is going bye-bye. Yeah, it's interesting that I believe he drew two lands off that Divination. Oh, boy. Which means he didn't cast a Helm the previous turn. I would probably have cast a Helm. Yeah, I just put it's it on the Crocent Druid. Instead of the Divination, I would lean towards it. But he... he boy, might have he's finding lands. a lot of lands, yeah. I mean, he has to start unblocking now. Yeah, I guess he can play a land, play Sylvan Awakening, and use it to buy himself another turn. Yeah, he could do that. I mean, it's but not where you want to be, but... It's a five-mana fog. Yes. That Ar it's sorcery speed, so Aaron knows about it. It's not yes. like you get him to invest his mana, and no. then you fog. No. Yeah. Sylvan Awakening has been generally pretty unimpressive. I'm not really high on the card. It's very hit or miss, mm -hmm. right? Either he wins you the game on this pot or he does absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the absolutely nothing cases. And I think that should have been an attack here by Billy. That Crimson Druid is not going to block anything because nothing will attack. The lands are indestructible. Right. So you're kind of protecting yourself against the Vicious Offering, but you wouldn't even want to. Like, you, you're you not going to chum block anyway, yeah, I don't gonna think. going to take it in any case. You could double block the home rate if there is a Vicious Offering coming, but that is such a corner... Scenario. And I don't believe there's issues offering in that deck anyway. Right. So yeah, we were talking about Aaron's that they know that. lack of removal. Cabal Paladin, go. So the Sylvan Awakening does its job. It means that Billy takes no, no damage this turn. But boy, he really needs to get something rolling. And quickly. 
This Croson Druid on its own is not going to be able to keep up. Is this a Primordial Worm? Ooh! Okay. He finds a Primordial Worm. How big can that Dreadshade get? 6-6? Six, six? Yeah, it can get big enough to trade, but not to survive, even if Aaron plays on land. Uh-oh, this is quick mana. Yeah. Ruben has Eviscerate for the Worm. And I believe that is game over. Uh, not immediately, but... But effectively? Yeah. I mean, Billy can... He you can know. get him to one unless he chumps? Yeah. Billy can block the, the Paladin if everything attacks and go to one, or in this spot he can just block the Shade and be at six, or take everything and go to one. I don't like any of those options if I'm sitting in Billy Haunt seat, I'll be honest with you. Oh, no, they're all horrible. Yeah, terrible position for Billy to be in. Boy, I, I, you know, I feel like that divination turn really punished him here. You know, he had a way to potentially come back by going Helm of the Host, go take my medicine. Then the next turn, play, uh, equip Helm of the Host and just kind of cross your fingers. But, you know, if he had three or four Croson Druids out, well, this board doesn't look nearly as bad at this point. Yeah. It's risky. I mean, it can go very poorly for you. But at the same time, he had a Cloud Reader Sphinx in hand. True, got true. So he had a plan already for turn five. No, so that's a great point. So you can understand why he didn't think he was going to be equipping that helm. He mm -hmm. was just trying to draw something with the donation, maybe even a fifth land. No, but that's a very good point, Once Paul. that got taken away, then he was just left with absolutely nothing. Yeah. And then the game ended. Yeah, and divest isn't something that uh, he necessarily was going to consider in that plan as well. There's another land, and it was a broken blonde plate, and Billy Hunt's going to extend the hand. That's Aaron Rubin. Taking the match two games to one and moving on to the semis. You can see he's pleased with himself there a little. There you go. You yeah. can smile, Aaron. It's fine. <laughs> you, just, you just made it to the semis. Oh, wait. <laughs> Looks like he looked into the camera and his fans behind us kind of <laughs> got the vibe. They like that. All right. So that actually is our last quarterfinal finishing up here. Aaron Rubin wins over William Hahn. That puts him up against Robert Brown who defeated Andrew Ellenbogen. And then it was Matt Stanky versus Will Craddock. Will Craddock advancing to the semis. And Vikram Kudva defeats Daniel Rosas. And uh, he's going to be playing against Craddock. And welcome back to the booth here in uh, Dallas. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe, and this is Paulo Vitor Domodorosa. Thanks so much for joining us for coverage of the top eight. We've got a few more rounds to go, and we're going to be crowning our champion. We've got a short commercial break. When we come back, we'll have more. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> 